Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is March 25th, 2021, and today I'm going to continue with my series on the prophetic uh, meanings of the instructions for Passover, the instructions that God gave specifically to Moses for keeping the Passover. So let's get right into this. The next command regarding eating the Passover lamb is that it had to be roasted in the fire, not boiled in water, nor eaten raw. This command looks forward to Jesus' willingly sacrificing his life. Just prior to his crucifixion, he said, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Whoever preaches this, think about it. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's Luke 12, verses 49 to 53. Prior to this, John the the Baptist said concerning Jesus, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's uh, Luke 3, 16. So, we need to consider what is fire in Scripture? What does it represent? Why did God's law demand that certain sinners be burned after they were stoned to death for their sin? Did he do that in order to illustrate endless torture in hell, as most religious people think? The church really has to reconsider its whole notion of hell and eternal torment in hell. What does the scripture teach about God? God is a God of mercy. He is a God who always extends mercy, even to those who rebel against him. What would endless torment mean? You know, there is a great Christian writer from the 1800s named George MacDonald. And I can't remember the exact words, but a very poignant episode in one of his many books that are all worth reading, where someone did something that really offended another person and that other person then consigned the one who sinned against him to hell forever. And the person responded something like this. I couldn't sin enough against you in order to deserve an eternal punishment in hell. Think about that. Can you sin that much? Let's read Deuteronomy 33 verses 1 through 4. This is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones, that's the Kodeshim, with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people, and all his Kodeshim were in his hand. What else is in his hand? Flaming fire. So they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you. When Moses commanded us a law as a possession for the assembly of Jacob. Deuteronomy 33 verses 1 through 4. Notice in this passage that flaming fire is at or in God's right hand. Notice also that his holy ones are in his hand. God's holy ones literally comprise his flaming fire. These are the ones who follow in God's steps. They know his ways. These are those that receive direction from their Lord. They respect and obey the law he commanded Moses. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 10. 
As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's one hundred million. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Here again we see God himself described in terms of fire. Fire defines his very throne, the symbol of his rule and authority. Scripture occurs to me that I want to uh, take us to now. It's um, Isaiah 33, I believe. Okay, this is Isaiah 33, verses 14 and 15. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Zion is a picture of what is supposed to be holy. Jerusalem, prophetic Zion is the new Jerusalem. But in the natural, Zion was a physical place. It was Old Jerusalem, and this is speaking about Old Jerusalem here, the sinners in Old Jerusalem, the sinners in the church today are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Then the question, who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? See, that's the way that God is shown in Daniel chapter 7. So who can dwell with consuming fire? Who can dwell with eternal burnings? Then the answer in verse 15, Isaiah 33, 15. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, who shuts his eyes from looking on evil. He will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. And it goes on with some very beautiful prophetic words. Now I want to draw our attention now to Jesus' words in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 50. He says this, If your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot offends thee, cut it off. It is better for you to enter, halt into life, or lame, crippled, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dies not and their fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire. Everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost his saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So Jesus says, everyone shall be salted with fire. You and I are no exceptions. 
So the question is this, are we really to pluck out our eyes when we look upon someone with lust? Are we to cut off our arms or our feet if we find that we sin by using them? This is what Jesus tells us to do, right? Does he expect us to do that? Well, what would happen if I did? If I gouge out one eye because I'm lusting after a woman, my other eye is going to lust after that woman too, or another woman. So then I gouge out my other eye? If Jesus does not mean for us to actually do this, then what does he mean? If we can't literally follow his instructions here, how do we know what instructions to follow? How can we know what to do or not to do? How can we know when Jesus speaks literally or when he doesn't? How can I know anything? The psalmist says, the sum of your word is truth. So the key is we have to study God's word. We have to read God's word. We have to learn God's word. We have to know God's word. And we have to obey God's word. In the scripture, fire describes the application of God's word. Listen again. In the scripture, fire describes the application of God's word to your life, to my life. Those who learn to apply it in this life save their souls and become useful tools in the hand of God. Only the Kodeshim do that in this life. This entire 2,000 year period of time has been the time when God has called out his holy ones, the Kodeshim. Those who do not do this during this life that we live now, in this age, those who do not do it will have their part in the lake of fire. What's the lake of fire? These people who do not apply the word of God to their lives today, these people who say that they can sin and still be a member in good standing in the church, these people who connive and plan how they're going to cheat others to make money to become rich when they're in the church, rather than applying the word of God to their lives, these people will have their part in the lake of fire. They will be salted with fire. Jesus tells his disciples to apply the word now, to apply his word now. So we are to salt ourselves with fire now while we have that sovereign choice to do so because everyone will be salted with fire which is the application of god's word to their lives not eternal torment in a literal fire now moving on to another topic It's interesting that God only commanded Israel one time to put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorposts and their lentils. And this one time was when they still lived in Egypt. In the scripture, Egypt represents, that is, it is a type of the world. So prophetically, Egypt means the world. Israel's And there's quite a few examples of that in the scripture. Assyria, Babylon, and others. Moab, Edom. 
Israel's dwelling in Egypt, then, is a picture of all God's people living in the world. Passover shows mankind the only way to escape ultimate death. And the death in view is his soul's death, not physical death. Because since the time of Adam, every man but one, two, or three have died physically. So the death in view in Scripture is the soul. Are we going to Are we going to work out our salvation in fear and trembling? But the first aspect of putting the blood on the doorpost only one time foreshadows that Jesus would shed his blood for all men and that that sacrifice brings spiritual life to all men. The first salvation is the salvation of the Spirit effected by the one sacrifice of Jesus. He only has to die one time. We apply that blood to our lives by faith, we believe it, we receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit, and then we move on toward the second aspect of salvation, which is the salvation of the soul. Every Israelite had to apply this blood to their own two doorposts and lentil, or else the death angel would destroy every firstborn in their home in the coming night the beginning of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The death angel only killed the firstborn, not everyone in the house. So this this is an important aspect of prophecy. The firstborn here represent the firstborn out of God's ultimate and total creation. Most families have more than one child. Most animals have more than one uh, calf or whatever it is. And the firstborn is the first that opens the womb. And the death angel only killed the firstborn of men and beasts in Egypt. Now let's read a couple of New Testament verses. John 1, verses 10 through 13. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 12 again, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become. It doesn't say to all who believed in him, they immediately became children of God. They received a right to become. The question is, will they be placed as sons into God's kingdom? Will they make the cut? Will they be considered the firstborn of God? And then in uh, John 12, verses 35 and 36, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, Believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These two verses show that the first step of a child of God, a son of light, 
is to believe in Jesus, who is God. The Israelites showed that they believed in God by placing the blood on their doorposts and lintels according to God's command. The penalty for failing to do this, the death of all firstborns within the individual houses, and the rest of the commands for observing Passover show that this feast, like all others and like all the teaching in Scripture, relate to becoming a son of God, not simply escaping hell. The church, for the most part, only teaches the milk of God's word. It does not teach the meat necessary for growing up to become a son of God, the meat necessary to become a kodeshim, a holy one. Becoming a son of God is all about the salvation of one's soul. This is the salvation of our mind, our will, our emotions. It's all about being conformed to God's image. Now I'm going to review the list of the specific commands concerning Passover again. First, the lamb had to be eaten on the night of Nisan 15. It had to be roasted on the fire, not boiled in water or eaten raw. Three, it had to be eaten with unleavened bread, not leavened bread, unleavened. Four, it had to be eaten with bitter herbs. Five, it was to be roasted whole with its head, legs, and inner parts, and also none of its bones could be broken. Six, no flesh of the lamb could be left until the morning. Seven, each Israelite was to eat his lamb with his loins girded. Eighth, they had to eat it with shoes on their feet. Ninth, they had to eat with a rod in their hand. And ten, they had to eat it in haste. Eleven, no foreigners could eat the Passover lamb. Twelve, the lamb had to be eaten in one house and none of its flesh could be taken outside of that house. Thirteen, every member of the nation of Israel was to eat the lamb. And fourteen, besides women, only a male who had been circumcised could eat it. Strangers who sojourned with Israel were circumcised, who were circumcised, could also eat it. Now, last time, we saw that eating unleavened bread foretells eating, that is, bringing into ourselves true doctrine and living out that doctrine without hypocrisy. Then we learn that roasting the lamb relates to Christ's baptism of fire upon our own lives, which represents a total submission to his ways and his word. Now let's look at eating with bitter herbs. <clears throat> Today's end time church, especially seen in the church of Laodicea, but I think that the church of Thyatira is also very much applicable to the charismatic church, for example, um, and any of the prosperity doctrine churches. These churches cannot relate to eating bitter herbs. To them, believing in Jesus is their ticket to a better life here on earth. It's a life filled with healing, riches, every good thing. They do not understand that this command looked forward to God's word to Ezekiel and to John, the beloved disciple. Let's read from Ezekiel 3, 1 through 11. This prophesies about bitter herbs. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. <clears throat> Obviously, this is the word of God. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with the scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language, whose words you cannot understand, 
Surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me, because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Harder than flint I have made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you, receive in your heart, and hear with your ears, and go to the exiles, to your people, and speak to them, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Say it, whether they hear or refuse to hear. That was Ezekiel 3, verses 1 through 11. And then to John, the apostle in Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel, and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, You must again prophesy about many people and nations and languages and kings. That was Revelation 10, verses 8 through 11. Now, what's the application of these words? What's the application of Ezekiel and Revelation? It's this. Any time a prophet or a true teacher of the word of God receives a new word from God, that word seems at first sweet to them. The great God of the universe is speaking directly to them. Have you ever received a new word? Have you read your Bible and suddenly, boom, the light goes on. Inspiration, you realize, wow, I didn't even think of that. You know, God gave that to me. God gave me understanding of this. If that has not happened to you, then you need to do, you need to pray this prayer. Father, I pray for eyes to see and I pray for ears to hear. I pray for understanding of your word because I cannot understand it in my own mind, in my own flesh. I can't figure it out. I can't go and look at all the books. I can't go and figure out all the gematria I can't go and learn all the original languages and even then understand it. And you can't. And that's where a lot of people have gotten deceived and have gotten sidetracked because they thought if they just got smart enough, if they just learned enough in the natural, if they could just become an expert with respect to Hebrew or Greek, or understanding the coded messages, the gematria found throughout the Bible. Then they could figure out all things. There was a time way back in the 80s, early 80s. and In the early 80s, I was a computer programmer. And uh, I actually had an idea at that time of developing a database of scripture. I would put all the scripture into... Uh, a database, and then develop a program where I could ask a question. And I literally was thinking about doing this. Put in any question you want, and then it would the question would be looked at by the computer, and then it would go into the Bible and find your answer. Well, the Lord obviously led me not to do that. You know, 
That really just amounts to witchcraft. The word of God is so much more subtle than that. The word of God is, it's, it's, um, it's hidden. It's like a code book. And you can only understand it when God opens your eyes and God opens your ears. He has to open your eyes so that you see the spiritual reality. He has to open your ears so that you can hear him speak to you while you're reading his word or while you're just sitting out on your porch enjoying the wind that he sends or playing your instrument. So, so pray that prayer. If, you're not, if you are not receiving words from God, understanding from God, pray that prayer and God will answer that. And when, when he does, you will see how sweet that is, how amazing that is. But as any prophet or godly teacher will tell you, the working out, the preaching of, the application of that word is bitter. Very, very bitter. The main reason for this, just as God tells Ezekiel, is that the people you preach to will not believe you. They will call you legalistic. They will call you divisive. They will call you a false prophet. Or because of their own sin, they will simply rebel against the word. I can testify to you that in over 40 years of hearing the word and of teaching the word when I can, in places when I can, that this has always been the case with me, always. Very few people in my lifetime, and it's been now 44 years that I've been walking with God and that God has been teaching me from his word. Very few people within the church or anywhere else have ever heard anything I've had to say. I still remember one of the leaders of a, a very popular prophetic ministry say to me, 40 years ago now, practically 40 years ago, uh, because I was aspiring to be a home group leader, uh, you know, and you have some teaching responsibility at that. And he says to me, I see your ministry as at the back of the church. In other words, he was saying, don't think you have anything to say to the people. And I remember some specific things that I would say then that are true. They were true words that were just utterly rejected by the leadership of that church. And then I remember a time that was uh, 30 years ago, uh, a new church, and um, I was, um, I think it had just been made an elder at this church, and I asked the preacher, the main, the main man at this one, why don't you ever teach the law? Why don't you ever teach the relevance of God's law? And his answer to me was, the people are too cranky to hear it. Well, that tells you a lot, doesn't it? That tells you pretty much the state of the church. We actually had to, we left that church two years later and, and God had specifically led us to a particular place in 1989 to be part of this church. It was right when I ended at the end of law school and, um, Really, part of it was in response to my wife's prayer where she prayed, Lord, show us the church. 
well, for the next 10 years, 10, 10 years, he showed us the church. And, and that's continued. You know, we literally have not been in church now for over 20 years. And it's because most of the church is corrupt. Most of the church does not teach the truth. Most of the church is afraid of the truth. They're certainly afraid of bitter herbs, you know. Men love the sweetness of God's word, but they hate the application of that word, which makes their life bitter for a season. Bitter because they must change They must change their lives in order to walk by that word. That's why it's bitter. Your flesh hurts when you apply it. This is why God commanded Israel to eat their Passover lamb with bitter herbs. The overcomer's life, the holy one's life, the Kodeshim's life, is one of applying the sweet words of God to his own life, to his soul. Applying the word of God to our soul. And the outworking of that is bitter. It's no wonder then that most of the church changed the feast of Passover to the pagan holiday known as Easter or Ishtar, a feast filled with bunny rabbits, colored eggs, and sweet ham, a feast where the Passover lamb and the bitter herbs have long been forgotten.